Devil is on his way. Devil is on his way, motherfucker. Oh, the devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Fall to your knees. Devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Motherfucking knees. Are- Mountain Murders is an Appalachian true crime podcast. Some content may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. We say fuck a lot. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to Mountain Murders New Year Edition. Wow. Brand it's... new year, Dylan. I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. Yeah. And this I is the guess you are. <laughs> first episode of 2023. Happy yeah. New Year. Happy, you know, by 2022, you didn't do a whole lot for us. I, I think everybody had PTSD during the entire 2022 From... year. From what? COVID? The pandemic? From the pl- the pandemic. The, and you were going to call it the pandemic. I'm sorry. I've been listening to a lot of conspiracy shows. Um, from the pandemic to uh, just, I don't know. I'm, we could literally have an hour podcast talking about all the shit. All the shit that happened in 2022? Well, just uh, all the stuff that happened before. And it took us a year. I think everybody just took a year off. So this is, you know, at first we were like, well, 2022 has got to be better, right? We just took a year off. We had to recover, shell shocked, and twenty twenty three is going to be that year when we all move forward. You think so? Yeah, I like that. It's very optimistic, Dylan. I start every January first off like this, and then by December thirty first, I'm beaten down and downtrodden. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> but you had made all those resolutions of either it will or it won't. Well, that's always true. That's like a law of physics or law of the natural world that we know. Um, you cannot change that fact that it will or it won't. And it, once you realize that and you embrace it, I really think I could start, um, I don't know if I'd call it a religion, but some kind of a, let's just call it a cult. How about a philosophy? A f- <laughs> okay, wow. A, a philosophy around that very, that tenet. It will or it won't? Yes. Okay, well, it's like you're the the Dilly Lama, right? I've been the Dilly Lama for years. So we're going to start a movement where folks can practice Dilly Lama-isms. Yeah, right. don't don't worry about it. You should have a podcast where you just give people terrible advice. It's it's the advice I've been following all this time, and it's not worked out for me. I see how unsuccessful you are. (laughs) I feel like this... um, applied correctly in the right set of circumstances that um, this philosophy actually could help you um, not ach- achieve your dreams. Ach- yeah, exactly. Right. Yes, I'm selling t-shirts available at my website. Because you are sleeping past your alarm to get up and do productive things. Okay. <laughs> Happy New Year, folks. Dylan is in rare form today. And we are still in Kentucky this weekend with a case that we have to talk about, Dylan. It's a good one. Well, we're not, I'm not going to let go of the conversation we were having before we started here. <sighs> what was the conversation we were having okay. before we got started? I told you your kid was goofy as fuck, okay? And just instantly, almost like you were waiting for me to say that, because you knew it was coming, probably. Um, you said, well, your kids are goofy as fuck, too. And I said, I never denied that my kids are goofy as fuck, Okay. Or Goofy. We'll just go with Goofy. That's too many F-bombs in a row. So, uh, yeah, you want to pick it up right there? I never did either. My kid wasn't Goofy. Okay. Right? Okay, so they're all Goofy. I mean, I asked her, do you not know how to cook when she burned the French toast and there was smoke all in the kitchen and I had to air it out and I had to turn the vent fan on, the microwave. That could have been used the whole and time to keep the kitchen And then I asked her, was there a yes. reason why she left the stove on after she had made the burned French toast? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I did it. You just did. And then she's trying to gaslight me that she didn't. Well, at least she attempted to gaslight you into something that wasn't true. So, okay, we had the idea that we're going to start a shitty parents podcast <laughs> for people who probably shouldn't be parents, but you are, and you love your kid, eh, most of the time. Yeah, but you do just little shitty things. Um, yeah, I think this is a really great project. I wanted to move forward. Um, little things like uh, finishing your snack in the car before you get home so you don't have to share it with them. Or eating all their cereal at midnight because you've been eating edibles all evening. Things like this. 
Just right. little small things. Yeah. Not abusive, dangerous things. No. Like it, you can't take them to Disney on ice because it's, quote, sold out, but it's really because you just don't want to fucking take them to Disney on ice. Yeah. And that kind of thing. You don't want to drop $700 on a night out at yeah, Disney on it's ice. it's terrible. Oh, it's sold out. Yeah, it's little things like that. <clears throat> All right. So if you're down with the Shitty Parrot podcast, uh, give us a shout out. Let us know. Dylan, can we get into today's case? You're distracting me. It is a, an excellent case, and I guarantee you've never heard it before. Okay, let's go. I know you've never heard it. I'm going to stop. someone out there from Kentucky may know the story. I'm going to stop distracting you, and I want to start the podcast right now. Okay. okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Marion Miley was born February 18th of 1914 to parents Fred and Elsie. She was an only child, and her early years were spent in Philadelphia. Okay. <laughs> Her father took a job as a golf pro at St. Lucci Country Club in Fort Pierce, Florida in 1921, moving the family down south. Her father immediately started grooming his daughter for sports greatness. Her mother, Elsie, had been in the fashion industry and passed on her sense of style to her daughter, Marion. Marion reveled in the Florida sunshine, enjoying swimming and horseback riding. Naturally athletic, Marion excelled at most sports she tried. She loved music and had been playing piano since she was very young. By the age of 12, she was commanding the golf course. Have you ever played golf, Heather? I'm not... I'm not a good golfer. I, mean, I lack the tried? skills, the hand-eye coordination, the patience. The height. There you're... are a lot of yeah. small people who play golf, Dylan. Is there really? Okay. Sure. Um, just in your case, it's not working out. I'm just not. Yeah, it's not for me. Yes, I've played golf. I worked at a country club. Oh, yeah. Where I could play golf for free. And it was not good. Okay. <laughs> Why are you just staring at me like that? <laughs> like you're imagining me playing bad golf. Now, at the time, Florida was in the midst of a real estate boom. The Florida land boom of the 1920s was Florida's first real estate bubble. This pioneering era of Florida land speculation lasted from 1924 to 1926 and attracted investors from all over the nation. The land boom left behind entirely new planned developments that were incorporated into towns and cities. Major investors and speculators such as Carl G. Fisher also left behind a new history of racially deed-restricted properties that segregated cities for decades. Among those cities at the center of this bubble were Miami Beach, Coral Gables, Miami Springs, uh, Opelika, Miami Shores, and Hollywood. It also left behind the remains of failed development projects such as Aladdin City, which is in the south Miami-Dade County area, Fulford by the Sea in what is now New, uh, I'm sorry, North Miami Beach, and a bunch of others, Biscayne Bay and Boca Raton. Now, these sound like some prime real estate. Right. So this land boom shaped Florida's future for decades and created entire new cities out of the Everglades land that still remain today. Now, by the time Marion was 16, she had graduated from the St. Uh, Lucci High School or St. Lucci County High School. The onset of the Great Depression was... Um, in effect, and busted Florida's real estate bubble. So you got this huge real estate boom happening, the depression hits, and that bubble just pops. Blow. Yes. Yeah, it's just a mess. <laughs> it's a real estate bubble everywhere. And so Fred had to move the family to Lexington, Kentucky, where he would serve as golf pro at the Lexington Country Club. And by all accounts, Fred was very concerned about this land bubble, this burst. All of the cake golf jobs in Florida just seemed to dry up. And being a golf pro, he didn't have a whole lot of other marketable skills. So he had to work in this industry, and that's why he chose to move the family to Lexington where he could still make a living. Yeah, I would say a lot of those uh, fancy developments they were trying to do or incorporated golf courses and all that. And uh, But uh, that's a very specialized skill, a golf pro. So, I mean, you know, that doesn't really – crossover to any other industry so right that makes sense that if uh, that's all he knows and uh, wants to stay in you got to go somewhere where there's still golf courses 
And Marion was not happy about this move. She loved Florida, the weather, her group of girlfriends. I mean, she loved everything about it. So moving to Kentucky was not ideal for the young woman. In 1930, Marion, who had expressed her interest in becoming a doctor or maybe doing mission work, attended Florida State College for Women. There she studied music and physical education. However, Marion dropped out in 1932 after her sophomore year to pursue golf full time. Now, can you imagine being so talented, so gifted in a sport that you believe you can go pro? Um, no, no. I mean, I, I, mean, think I that's so amazing, right? Just to be operating at that level and, uh, you know, uh, beating everyone around you being, you know, state champ or best in your region, um, I could not imagine that. I've never done anything like that. It's so cool. I'm not saying that I couldn't. I just didn't have the opportunity. My potential was um, used up on other things. Does that make sense? Like, like surviving and shit. Smoking. Elsie oh. managed the Kentucky Club. Now, the family resided in a small apartment on the second floor of the country club. Eventually, Fred would move to Cincinnati to take another job and leave the two women behind. Marion had developed tremendous skills under her father's tutelage. With the Lexington Country Club so easily accessible, Marion focused solely on golf. She started competing in amateur tournaments around the state. Marion also took on a job working for Standard Oil as an inspector and doing advertising. Standard Oil saw what everyone else did, a tall, gorgeous woman who looked great in the uniform. It didn't hurt that she was also dedicated, direct, and determined. Her good looks earned the nickname, quote, the flower of the fairways. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. One reporter described Marion as the most photographed golfer in the world. She gave great interviews, had a very positive and delightful personality, so she was often seen in newspapers and in movie theater reels. That's mm -hmm. interesting. She yeah. must have been quite the looker. She was very pretty. Yes, she was. Very striking. I think it's interesting how movie theater reels were such a thing back in the day. Yeah. You got your news, like a little bit of celebrity gossip. Yeah, I almost wish it um, still existed. You Instead know, of social media? <clears throat> well, no. Just, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Every time I see an old-timey like, newsreel, and uh, especially you know, it has like that kind of cliche you know guys speaking about it and and now on the north shore yeah. you know, some in the the theater in the war right. you know, i'm doing terrible but you know what i mean i always think it's very interesting and uh now you just get um dumb cartoons shitty trailers let's go to the concession stand and, and have the, an ice cold pepsi and right? the cup that tries to get you to spend another hundred dollars and at the, the wiener that like stands. jumps a backflip into the bun yeah Whoa, wow. No, I want to see that one. That's my favorite one. Okay, so she is, uh, would you say, um, a local celebrity? A local celebrity. That's a great way to describe her, Dylan. Okay. While women's amateur golf was in its glory days, the Ladies Professional Golf Association had yet to form. And golf offered little as far as a like financial compensation for these female players. So it was understandable that Marion had to take on a full-time job in addition to pursuing a golfing career. Well, and that to this day, you know, women athletes um, are, are, paid far are, are seeking less. Equi equi equitable pay. And in and, and the WNBA, I saw one of their players talking about this the other day. They're not like, you know, and everybody's always like, well, the men's basketball is more exciting. And they, so they just want the same percentage. They're not asking. She was like, I don't want to be paid what LeBron is. He's obviously produce, you know, helping produce this much money. I just want the same points on, on, on all that he produces that he gets. And I totally agree with that. I totally agree. I don't, I don't care what anybody thinks it, that the WNBA is not good or whatever. There's plenty of people that love it and watch it. And uh, I think they should have the same percentages. When they sell a jersey – they don't get points on that jersey like well, a lot of the male players honestly, do. Honestly, I mean, we could have a whole discussion about this, Dylan, but it's the same um, issues with professional cheerleading. The, oh. Like the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. Super iconic, known all over the world. The uniform, everything, right? And those women hardly make a penny 
I mean, they are paid so little, like per game. It's like they should be happy to. Uh, you're lucky to be a Dallas Cowboy girls cheer, exactly. Or cheerleader. Exactly, and the and they have to work full time jobs, and the amount of time and energy, and the rules, and all the stipulations they have to adhere to. But then they're getting paid like fourteen dollars a game or something. It's and don't outrageous. Get, and don't get me started on competitive cheer. Because they won't even class the uh, fi- classify that as a sport, which my God, the things they do, it, it's incredible, and, and they are co-ed the teams to a degree, but they're mostly women, and uh, they won't even classify it as a sport, so they can get certain types of insurance with a decent premium for if they, you know, get a severe injury, which happens when all they the time. Tumble from down the pyramid. Yeah, or when, when they're flung, you know, thirty feet in the air, and you know, a bad land, and you can get so hurt, and they won't even classify it as a sport. Uh, yet again, just a full-on assault on women and their rights. But NASCAR's a sport. Well, I mean, they're going. Yeah. He's going to go left. He's going to turn left. No, no big deal there. Okay, let's get back to it. Okay. We need to have a special so episode about this. Marion, you know, she's working full time pursuing this golfing career. Marion was making it despite the fact that the entire country was bogged down uh, with the Great Depression. Mary and Miley saw her first major golfing success in 1931 when she won the Kentucky State Championship, a title she successfully defended the following year. She first participated in the United States Women's Amateur Golf Championship in 1933. One year later, Marion participated in the Orange Blossom Tour in Florida for the first time. She saw great success as a golfer, winning many major tournaments in the country. Miley played for the United States in the Curtis Cup in 1934, 1936, and 1938. Marion was hobnobbing with celebrities like Bob Hope, Clark Gable, and Bing Crosby. Wow. She played in over 100 charity events. Her distance off the tee made her even more popular. She could hit the ball even further than Hall of Fame golfer Peggy Berg. And at one uh, of her driving contests at a tournament, Marion outdistanced 1932 Olympic champion Babe Didrikson. Wow. By age 27, Marion was one of the top women's champions in golf. She was home for a few days to relax before getting back on the road. It was September 28th of 1941 when Marion was awakened by loud noises coming from the downstairs. Now, she and her mother are in this apartment above the country club. Her mother lets out a scream, and that's when Marion grabbed a golf club and went to help. Just seconds later, a bullet entered the left side of Marion's spine, tearing through her trapezius muscles. It exited about three inches above her left breast. The second bullet hit the brain, leaving her body through her cheek. She was dead before her body hit the apartment floor. But Marion, who was not one to go down without a fight, had managed to bite the leg of her assailant. Before being shot. Oh, my God. On the floor, Marion laid in a crumpled heap. Her face turned to the right, and her left arm was above her head. The pajama top she wore was soaked in blood and torn. Red palm prints stained the walls, and fragments of bone and brain matter were on the floor. 72-year-old widow James Watson was asleep when he heard these gunshots. They woke him up. His two-story house boarded with the south side of the or bordered, I'm sorry, with the south side of the Lexington Country Club where the shots had come from. So he stands at the window when a second set of shots rang out from the same direction. He rarely had a decent night's sleep these days with health problems, and now this. He looked across red maples that divided the two properties. The night had gone quiet again, though he did notice the club's front light, which was usually burning, was off. Watson had been feeling a bit fuzzy lately, not remembering things exactly as they happened, and sometimes he just wasn't sure what was real or not. So he climbed back into bed, doubting what he'd thought he'd heard. So uh, they lived in an apartment on the country club ground. Yes. Like literally ab- like above the clubhouse. Above clubhouse, the clubhouse yes. Okay. What has, this is, this, okay, okay, I'm riveted. I'm just like, what what the hell's going on? As a robber rooted around in a dresser drawer, it was dark and his vision was limited. There wasn't anything of value in these drawers. Marion's mother, Elsie, age 52, was leaning against the headboard of her twin bed. She had had heard the three gunshots and 
she was clutching her own stomach as shots were delivered to her body. Um, that's when her breathing becomes more labored. One of the robbers had a scarf partially covering his face. He demanded to know where the money was. Only a few hours earlier, the club had hosted a dance. Information passed along by a groundskeeper suggested there would be a large sum of cash in this apartment. When Elsie didn't answer him, he hit her across the face with the butt of his gun. He finally pointed um, to the bottom drawer and asked if that's where the money was. And she told him, yes, there was a leather money bag in the bottom drawer. Just as he held the money bag, headlights from a car flashed into the room. 17-year-old paper boy Hugh Kramer drove past the gate for his regular delivery. He followed the same route every morning after leaving the newspaper building at Short and Market Streets. Kramer usually stopped at the south side of the clubhouse, where he threw a rolled-up newspaper out the window near the door of the second-floor apartment. Yet this morning, something was different. In the darkness, a strange car was near. He knew Marion had a brand new yellow coupe that she had only purchased a few months earlier, and Mrs. Miley drove a sedan. This Buick was two-toned and had Jefferson County plates. He had never seen it before. The passenger door was open. He got out of his car to check the driver's side of this Buick, but no one was inside the car. Deciding not to further explore, Kramer loaded back into his car to finish his newspaper job. But it was odd enough he took note of the make, model, license plate and all that so it was the car was out of place it was nearly an hour and 15 minutes after the shooting that a neighbor named jm giles who owned a local sanitarium called police after finding mrs miley on his doorstep ringing the bell a man named price and his wife myra um, the Lacys, from the ben mar sanitarium arrived first at his home Mrs. Miley was on the porch laying across the front door threshold. Her nightgown was matted with blood. She had facial wounds. Giles had placed a blanket over the shivering woman. She had managed to crawl a quarter mile to his home. That's, I mean, just the, the human, the drive to survive. And, and that's so pitiful. You know what I mean? You said she was 72 years old. 52. 52 years old. Oh, my God. Giles relayed what the woman had told him. Two men wearing handkerchiefs over their faces broke into her apartment. They had shot her daughter, Marion, as well as her, but she had came to after they left. She tried to reach for the phone, but recalled the shorter, stockier robber had ripped the phone from the wall. Mrs. Miley had managed to slither her way down the stairs and crawl to, uh, to Giles' home. A few moments later, two Fayette County officers arrived on the scene. When one officer went to the apartment, he found the kitchen door was wide open. It was dark. When he tried to flip on a light switch, nothing happened. The 22-year-old officer had only recently joined the force. He forgot to bring a flashlight with him. Oh, poor guy. He's all excited and trying to, you know, do help. Yeah. Well, he had to feel his way down um, like across the kitchen and the lounge of the clubhouse. Um, finally, using a book of matches, he managed to get upstairs. The door leading to the apartment was smashed open with half of the upper rectangular panel broken through. Wood splinters were on the floor. A rug was bunched up at the far end of the wall. It was obvious a struggle had taken place. At the edge of the hallway, a bare foot was visible. Marion was on the floor, and by now she was in a pool of blood. Law enforcement had reached the country club's president, Curry Tunis. He was only told by police that there had been a robbery and that he needed to come right away. Six more police cars gathered along with two ambulances. A dozen uniformed officers were swarming the grounds. Marion's body was being loaded into the Kerr brothers' um, funeral home hearse. It was then that uh, Curry Tunis learned that Marion had been murdered. Police asked him for a list of everyone who had attended Saturday night's dance, along with all the employees' information and um, information about members of the country club. Raymond Skeeter Baxter. Skeeter. Got to have a Skeeter in the story, right? Uh, Skeeter always improves any story. So he had worked at the club, and he encountered an officer who would not allow him to pass by. 
Baxter explained that he was employed at the club and admitted to being there late last night. He said that Mrs. Miley flashed her light off and on, which was a signal to let him know she was okay. So police took down this information, noting that they would need to call on him later. Mrs. Miley was taken to St. Joseph's Hospital with three bullet wounds to the abdomen. Fred Miley was contacted in Cincinnati about an accident in Lexington. It was not until he reached Georgetown, Kentucky, about 16 miles from um from town, from Lexington, that he learned the real nature of what had happened. At a gas station, a newsboy was hawking papers with the headline about the Lexington attack and murder at the country club. <laughs> the old school news crier. Yeah. Yeah, get your paper. So here's this guy thinking there's been an accident and learns his wife and daughter have been In attacked. public like that, yeah. yeah. That sucks. Pretty horrible. Yeah, too muddled above the country club. Get your paper. A nickel. Would I be a good one? I don't think you sound like you're from Kentucky with that accent. But oh, sure. I'm sorry. In my head. We're going to cast you in Newsies. All the all the heralds are from New York. A little, little dance number <laughs> for you. Fred had last seen his wife and daughter about two weeks earlier at the Ladies National Amateur Championship, which had been held at the Lexington Club. It didn't take long for word to spread, and club members began pouring onto the country club estate to view the crime scene. Here we go. When Fred arrived, there was a crowd of law enforcement officers and, of course, members sort of mill milling around. Now, police wanted to know about Fred's life at the Makatiwa Club in Cincinnati. Uh, they ended up dispatching a Lexington officer to Ohio to do some secretive digging around. Now, I know there's country clubs um, everywhere basically, and golf courses. But it's funny to me, like, Lexington, Kentucky doesn't ring out as, like, a golf capital. You know what I mean? Why? You got all that old horse money? Well, that's true. I'm probably totally wrong. It's probably, like, a very thriving environment there. And then Cincinnati as well um, doesn't... You got some big industrial money in Cincinnati some, at the time. We've actually covered some stories that point that out. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Look, where there's money... There's where, golf. Where there's rich folk, there's golf, okay? I wonder who, uh, is that Scottish, right? Isn't that Scottish invention? I think so. Okay. Perhaps the Miley household had been troubled. Now, it raised more suspicion when Fred first asked about his daughter, Marion, and not his wife. Really? To police. Yeah. Now, emergency surgery was performed on Elsie. She had extensive internal damage along with blood loss to the organs, which were starting to shut down. Dr. Rankin, who happened to be son-in-law of Dr. Charles Mayo of, yes, that Mayo Clinic, performed the surgery and attended to Elsie. Because she was the only witness, police were posted outside her hospital room. An emergency meeting of the country club board members was called. When police asked what the meeting was about, uh, the board members were really kind of secretive and they didn't want to give too much information um, to cops, which is kind of weird. And they just expressed that they had been able to strike a deal with Ashland Club because, after all, their members still needed to play golf despite the tragedy that had happened. Oh, come on, man. What is wrong with the people? Look, we got, a, we got people that want to play through. Can you move those bodies? I mean, really? What the hell? God. You know, I have. I was trying not to get pissed off at rich people in this story, you know, because there's some good rich people, I guess. And, um, no, I'm just kidding. There is, obviously. But here we are. And it's probably just some asshole upper guy who thinks he has some kind of fake power that doesn't mean anything. You know what I mean? Some head of the board or some bullshit like that. But, yeah, here, here well, well, you know, how fast can we get this cleaned up? Or, you know, we want... The club functioning. I mean, who really even thinks like that? When two uh, two women's been brutally attacked, one murdered outright, and the other one uh, grievously, grievously injured. Clinging to life. Clinging to life. We're worried about hitting a little ball in a damn hole. Club head waiter Percy Thomas was next on the list for interview. He had began working at 3.30 p.m. the day before. When he departed at 1 a.m., Mrs. Elsie Miley was still tending to dance guests who were closing it down. Percy mentioned that a window behind the icebox in the kitchen had been left open. 
Sometimes, he explained, the kitchen was unbearably hot, and he had overheard some of the wait staff talking loudly outside, like like he had been outside and he could hear them kind of from the kitchen area or whatever. Yeah. So he suggested an assailant might have used the window to climb into the clubhouse. You have got to stop playing with the dog. We're podcasting. I'm not trying to play with him. I'm, I'm just, he's okay. Leave the dog alone. <laughs> he's accosting me. He's not. Maybe stop playing with him while you're trying to I was to trying to pick him See, up. See, now you've got him all riled. Marion's friend, Francis Laval, was questioned. Only 15 hours earlier, Francis, along with Marion, Margaret Isaacs, Louise Funk, this group of friends, had been at the country club, but decided to play cards instead of seeing a movie. They, they didn't really want to hang out at the dance, it didn't sound like. After a few hours, the girlfriends were playing gin rummy, and Marion was on a winning streak. Francis explained that Marion loved to gamble. Cards, dog tracks, horse racing. When Marion was kind of in the moment, she loved the uncertainty as it nipped at her heels. Okay, well, and that makes a sense. Uh, that makes sense to me for uh, someone like her who who's in her position. You know what I mean? She has all these things. Uh, she has to perform. You know, do all these charity events, and everything's kind of outlined for her. So I guess the uncertainty of gambling, uh, uh, she could find that appealing. Marion had even bought herself a five-cent Watling Rollator slot machine during a recent trip to Louisiana where they were still legal. Marion left around midnight because she had an early morning drive to Lancaster, Ohio for an exhibition match. Margaret drove Marion back to the club when the last of the members were finally leaving. So this would have been around... That 1 a.m. time frame. Marion offered for the girlfriends to stay over, but her friends rejected the offer. Marion had enjoyed writing, but she had actually given some of the papers she had written to her friend Francis to hold on to because she didn't want her mother to read them. Huh. Apparently, Marion was a very talented writer, but she had not wanted her mother to discover that she was a talented writer because she said she already had all this pressure to be a golfer yeah. from her dad. And she's like, oh, yeah, you and can be an author, too. If her mother read her writing, she'd be like, oh, you're the next Pearl Buck. And her plate was full. Exactly. <laughs> with being a, a, a golf phenom. Only two hours after the shooting, about 35 miles outside of Lexington... Tom Penny was driving Bob Anderson's Buick. Anderson divided up the money, handing him 59 bucks, which was half the take from the robbery and murder they had just committed. Penny, age 32, had left Lexington earlier that week coming to Louisville for work. He had served time with Anderson before in the mid-1930s, and he had met this guy, this buddy of his, at the bar he owned, The Cat and Fiddle. By now, Anderson had seemingly pulled himself together, even owning this legit business, um, this bar. And uh, Penny was kind of feeling down on his luck. That's why he had come to Louisville looking for work. His wife, Emma, had recently left him, had taken their kids, and filed for a restraining order. So the one guy's kind of figuring it out, getting his feet under him, legit legitimate business. And then the other guy's a shitbird. Yeah, but the, this but guy's a ship. Actually both ship He's birds. a shitbird too, because if you fly with a shitbird, you're you're in turn one. Well, Penny had recently told his buddy Anderson about a man he had met a few months back in a bar who worked at a country club. There was always a lot of cash on hand. The man had mentioned a scheme to rob the club, and Penny had not forgotten about it. Now the men were driving to the Louisville Canal near Portland. The canal was a fixture of the Ohio River, and this is where they planned to dispose of the guns. However, there were crowds of people enjoying the morning fishing. Some of them were walking, and some were just sort of waiting around for something exciting to happen. <laughs> just standing by just the river? standing around. Okay. Uh, sitting and looking, much like Dylan. Instead, the men drove to Fountain Ferry Park, on the outskirts of the park was a crumbling building where Anderson found a broken beer bottle. He began to dig a hole to hide the weapons. Penny handed over the 380. Anderson had only a tear in his pants from the events at the club, 
But Penny had blood on his shoes and a jacket sleeve. Anderson told him that he needed to get rid of these clothing items. That's when, uh, after they get rid of the gun, he tells him you need to throw away your your clothing. Your blood-soaked clothing. tainted clothing. Yeah. Uh, Anderson dropped Penny off. Now, it was around 8 a.m., and Penny made his way to Hardin's Beer Joint. He needed a drink after the rough Saturday night he had had of, you know, murdering innocent people. Murdering innocent people over uh, basically 120 bucks. He stayed all day drinking at Hardin's, dipping into the stolen money when he needed a refill. Before going to the bar, he had stopped by um, the apartment of some friends, the Daniels. They were a couple who had allowed him to crash on their sofa while he looked for work. He changed into a pair of busted up boots and grabbed an old coat. That's when he stuffed the bloody clothing items and his other shoes into a sack. Elwood Daniel had been the reason that Tom Penny had come to Louisville. Daniel, an auto mechanic by trade, had told Penny he was a fool to stay in Lexington when all the work was happening in Louisville. On his way to the bar... Uh, Tom Penny rented a room at a boarding house, waiting until Bob Anderson told him their next move. And he gave the sack of bloody clothing to a homeless man. And he was surprised that the bloody shoes actually fit the man. Nice. Hey, buddy, you need some, you need a clean change of clothes that's not blood covered? (laughs) Here, try this bag of clothes. It was at the bar that Penny heard a first report on the radio about Mary and Miley's murder and the injuries her mother had sustained. That's when he found a payphone and frantically called Bob Anderson. Two buttons from a man's coat, along with three slugs from a 32 caliber pistol, were discovered among the crime scene's effects. There had also been a report of a blue sedan near the club around the time of the murder. Detectives noted the home of Skeeter Baxter was just right around the corner from the club, about a mile away. Skeeter had been saving money to move to California, and they learned he had also had issues with alcohol and amphetamines. Wow. Now, when they speak to Skeeter, he tells investigators that he had put sprinklers out um, the the evening or the early morning hours that the, the murders had taken place or the murder had taken place. And that he had put these sprinklers out, and then he had passed out in his vehicle near the driving range. At 3 a.m., he had uh, awakened, and he saw Mrs. Miley flash her window light at him, which was a signal that around the same time every night, she would flash the light to let him know that she was okay. Oh, okay. So he's saying, well, I passed out, but then I saw her flash the light. Everything was cool. They find out that Skeeter had been arrested twice, um, once in 1939 and again in 1940 for receiving stolen property. Now, Fred Miley informs police that a few years earlier, Marion had reportedly noticed her old golf clubs had been stolen along with some money from the club. At the time, he had asked his wife to hire a night watchman. She had refused, stating the police whistle she kept in her nightstand was enough to alert Skeeter, who would come to her aid if needed. (laughs) They had also worked out this light signal. You just At wait. Night. You just wait till Skeeter gets here, you son of a bitch. You, you, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Exactly. Toot, toot. You just stay right there now. I think I don't like you tooting a whistle. You don't like that? No, just stop. Is it the way I look when I do it? It's all the things about it. Toot. And just, just put your lips on it and blow. Right? Like that? Isn't that Casanova? Casablanca? Something shit like that? What's a girl like you doing in a shitty place like this? Aren't those famous lines? You just butchered them. Oh, okay. All right. And it's actually like of all the bars in the world, she comes into mind. Well, that's what I said. Your joint, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Get those lips out. Just stop tooting, okay? <laughs> I'm tooting from now on. Sounds like you're just farting. Yeah. It didn't take long for Bob Anderson to seek some medical treatment for his leg. Um, now, remember, Marion had bit bitten his leg. Yeah. I hope he gets an infection and dies. So, like, that next day, he goes to get medical treatment for his leg. Now, he tells the physician a drunk lady had gotten out of control at his bar, and he had tried to toss her out, which led to the bite on the leg. Yeah, okay. Well, that's a plausible story, I guess. But there's another witness. 
Oh, knows, to the crime? Who knows that you've gotten a bite on your leg. Oh. And they will soon figure out that Marion had probably tried to fight these assailants. I'm just saying. Just leaving a trail of bread, breadcrumbs. Okay, so he's already on paper at a hospital with a bite from a human. Yes. Okay. Penny had gone back to Hardin's Bar the following Monday morning. So after he had drank his Sunday away, he went back and there he learned from a newspaper article that Mrs. Miley was still alive and had given a description of the assailants. The paper also reported at least one of the suspects was injured as Marion had fought back and that they were also noted to be driving a two-toned Buick. Oh, the two-toned Buick, that's what's going to stand out. Detectives went to Cincinnati to pay a visit to Fred's club and learn more about him because he's still considered a suspect. It's very odd that he doesn't ask about his wife. He's more concerned about his daughter. And he's just not even had a big part of this. You know, I mean, you've heard, you know, just because it's, it's almost like he's uh, not worried about it or, ah, oh, okay. Did he know something about this? Well, no, is this organic? They just decided to rob. Is he connected? The, oh. the father? Yeah. Yeah, he was like, we're going to rob and get $60 a piece. Okay. Makes total sense. Well, I mean, you know. Just stop. Everyone. <laughs> it will or it won't. <laughs> everyone described uh, Fred as a father who was very proud of his daughter, Marion, who was a regular fixture around the club. The fact that Fred had been keen on leaving behind his wife and daughter in Lexington didn't sit right with law enforcement. Yet it was known that many golf pros did not survive the Depression, and Fred had been eager to take the job in Ohio. Leaving his wife and Marion behind made sense. They got a free apartment, and Mrs. Miley was left running the club. So they'll have two incomes and a free place to live. Yeah, and his daughter, who has uh, got to be making some money and certainly getting some notoriety from her golf career, is uh, you know gets to play all she wants. And uh, yeah, makes. I mean, it kind of makes sense, right? Yeah, and she can come to Ohio and play at this other club, so she's getting free golf uh, at both clubs. Oh yes, I'm just now thinking that's not that. Yeah, that's not that far. Cincinnati's not that far from Lexington, right? No, some hours. Yet, Fred Miley was considered very attractive by many women at the club, according to his employer. He was known to flirt, but gossip never went beyond that. So they knew him as, eh, he could be a flirt, but they didn't actually know of him having affairs. Okay, so not an adulterer, just a handsome flirt. But he was an adulterer. He was? Yeah, he's, he's been having an affair this whole time. So the gossip was didn't know. The tea was uh, not being produced. Right. But, uh, you know, he, he's 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 putting it in somebody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's, he's, he's not throwing it in, is he's he? Just, he's putting it in somebody. <laughs> okay. Of all the witnesses, including the next door neighbor, the newspaper boy, and Mrs. Miley, they all agreed on the timing that this stuff had taken place sometime around, you know, between like 1 a.m., 3 a.m., got this time frame. However, Skeeter Baxter was the only witness who did not give the same timeline, and this concerned detectives. Well, and they're already kind of giving him a side eye because of his previous uh, arrest. Criminal history. His uh, known drug use. And back then it was even dare I say, even more profound when someone finds out you do use these hard drugs, they think of you as like you're a big old piece of crap, right? They don't trust you. A man named Tom Luns Lunsford showed up at the police station offering some insight into the case, and it was a break police needed. Lunsford described having been drinking at a place called the Cozy Corner about two weeks earlier <laughs> When a man named Tom Penny joined him. I want to go to the Cozy Corner and have a nice drink. Well, you've got the Cozy Corner. You've got Harden's Beer Joint. We've got the Cat and Fiddle. I have the Cat and Fiddle. I don't want to go hang out at all these places. That's great. We don't have any of those places. Penny, who knew Lunsford through his brother, asked the sheet metal worker if he could get a gun. Penny laid out a job at the country club and asked Lunsford to join him. Penny told him someone was arranging for the door to be left open at the country club, but he didn't know who. 
Because Penny was the kind of guy who was often like spouting off these plans, but never following through like these get rich quick scheme. What well, dude, it's like he's uh, thinks he's planning the Lufanza, uh, Lufanza heist. It's one of the, the biggest. Lutanza. The, yeah, it's just what I said. The Lufanza heist, one of the biggest in American history. And it, it, he, he kills two. The Lufanza heist? Yeah. <laughs> the LaHonda. <laughs> And uh, he kills two innocent women over like a you know chump change. Honestly, as far as jobs go, he acts like this is the one. You know, if we it's like in all those cliche movies, if we do this one job and then we're out for good. Well, again, Penny's this guy who's always like spouting off these plans. Like, man, we could go rob this bank and blah blah blah, but like never actually follows through with any of it. Yeah. So Lunsford just ignored him. So it's just this beer. Just some beer. This is beer drinking dog, Mac. It's beer drinking dog. Yeah. Yeah. Another interesting thing is, so Tom Penny, his brother-in-law is a man named Arlie Yates, who's a sergeant with the Lexington Police Department. Okay. And so, of course, you know, when the police are hearing about this guy, Tom Penny, they're like, wait a minute, that's Arlie Yates' brother-in-law, and he works with us. And so then they are going to start digging in even more um, into this story. These people had the best names back then, I swear. Hugh Kramer, Arlie Yates. I know. I mean, you know. Two and a half days after the murder, Tom Penny couldn't take the suspense anymore. And he finally went to visit Cat and Fiddle so he could talk to Bob Anderson. Bob Anderson ordered Penny to do something with his car. Because now they know about this Buick. This blue. Two-tone Buick. Two-tone Buick. Stands out. So, of course, nothing had gone as planned, just like the robbery. So, when Tom Penny goes to steal the car, there were no keys in it, and the door was locked. So, Penny has to, you know, be like, hey, I can't get your car. (laughs) You didn't leave it unlocked or any of the things you said you would do. So, Anderson meets up with him later, has the car running. Is like, here, take it. These um, guys are freaking morons. Yeah, dude. yeah. I mean, seriously, they're bumbling idiots. So, as Penny is stealing this car and riding out of town, he bumps into a friend who agrees to ride south with him. So, he's going to go get rid of this car. He bumps into this random dude who's like, Where are you going? And Penny's like, I'm just going to ride south. And the guy's like, I'll go with you. Oh, my God. I mean, so now you're bringing in another person. Yeah, another witness, in another this stolen car. Like, hey, this is a that's nice part of a murder. Two tone Buick. It's much, you know, it reminds me of that story going around about that robbery where the people was killed. Tom it's, Penny considered Florida as an option or maybe New Orleans. So he doesn't even know where he's taking this car. Just, he's heading south. He's just heading south. And now he's got someone else along for the ride. On Wednesday, October 8th, The funeral for Marion was held at St. Peter Catholic Church. The church was filled with club employees and others who knew Marion. She was very well loved, so there were lots and lots of people at her funeral. Later that evening, after muttering a few words no one understood, Mrs. Miley died with Fred by her side. The following day, the couple would have celebrated their 29th wedding anniversary. Damn. Mrs. That's a long time. Sorry. Mrs. Miley's funeral was held at the same church on October 3rd. So, um, I'm sorry, I said October 3rd, October 13th. <laughs> I can't. So, just a few days after Marion's. Those are different days, Heather. Yes, I know. A telegram had been sent. Now, this is kind of interesting. Um, by Bing Crosby on September 28th to the club board members because remember they were being very vague about this meeting oh well we just have to set up a place for our members to play but they'd actually gotten this telegram from bean crosby who was offering a reward for finding the persons responsible interesting but they they didn't tell law enforcement about this reward and they didn't make it public now get this dylan because members of the country club we're like, we don't know if we want to be associated with those Hollywood types. God. Really? That's how these people roll? These are like old money. Yeah. Oh, okay. So they can't 
I can't associate with those Hollywood types. So you don't make public uh, the reward by a notable, uh, possibly the biggest star at the time. I mean, those names you list all, Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, Clark Gable. I mean, this is back when celebrities were like gods, honestly. And uh, you would have got all kind of press, you know, got the word out there. It would have been a big deal. And they just keep it quiet because they're worried about what it would look like. What would the neighbors think? These people are assholes. So Tom Penny arrived along with his friend in Georgia, where the two popped in for a Georgia Bulldog football game. Because they're in Athens, why not? Then they headed to Mobile, Alabama. It was in Jackson, Mississippi that Penny sent a telegram to the cat and fiddle asking for $15. Okay. It was after picking up the money that Tom Penny made a confession to his traveling companion about the robbery gone wrong. So now he's telling his buddy this is what happened. This is why we're trying to get rid of this car. Yeah. And driving through the South. It was when detectives spoke to a teenager named Jimmy Hillen who admitted to being with Skeeter Baxter on the night of the murders that police perked up. Hillen described having seen a big blue sedan at the club and that Skeeter had approached the car and spoken to the two individuals inside. Now, when Skeeter had returned, he claimed it was a guy named Floyd Pointer and his girlfriend, but the boy thought it had been two men in the car. Jimmy also let it be known to law enforcement that Skeeter Baxter had plans to leave soon and head to California. He just needed some money which was something police had already known. But hearing this again, that Baxter is, you know, kind of desperately trying to hoard some money together. just <laughs> Because they didn't even, uh, you know, steal enough to like run on. So this was just a great plan. Knowing Skeeter Baxter lied, set off alarms for law enforcement. Because remember, he said he had put the sprinklers out. He fell asleep in his vehicle at the driving range. He saw the light flicker. He never once mentioned he'd been in the company of this teenage boy. Okay. Well, yeah, that's a pretty important... So leaving out this big detail. In a statement, Skeeter never mentioned this blue sedan at the club... He never mentioned having a conversation with anybody in a blue sedan. He left out the detail about having, you know, been in the company of this teenage boy, having had a discussion with somebody in this car. A bar owner in Louisville um, reported, uh, named Bob Anderson, by the way, had reported recently that his car was stolen. And police noted that it was a car that matched the description of the two-toned Buick that had been seen by several witnesses at the club. So this guy's reporting his car stolen like days after the car was seen at the country club. Uh, Yeah, that's not going to work for him, is it? I mean, that seemed, you'd be like, wait a minute. Why didn't you, this matches a car who, that was at a crime scene, but you didn't report it stolen then. Right. Right. Get off the computer. I'm not, well, I was looking at the images of this story. Was Skeeter Baxter the inside man? That's what law enforcement find themselves wondering. Well, they've like I said, they've already been giving them side eye the whole time. It was on October 8th in Fort Worth, Texas, that police spotted a Buick with out-of-state tags parked near a cemetery. Out of curiosity, the officers ran the tag number. So by now, Tom Penny and his friend had also picked up a female hitchhiker. And the three of them are just hanging out in this car outside of a cemetery in Texas. What the hell, dude? When they are asked to step out of this stolen vehicle. Tom Penny um, was arrested and the car was taken into custody at Fort Worth where it was examined by police. By the way, they find some casings, some shell casings lodged between the seats. So when you get rid of a car and the guns or whatever, bloody clothes used in a crime... You do it quickly and efficiently. You don't go on a a national tour in the stolen car. Right? And you don't pick up a friend and a hitchhiker. And you don't give the bag of bloody clothes to some random person on the street. You destroy them. And if you're bitten by someone you attacked, you don't go to the hospital in the same town or a town over. 
Yeah, all he had treatment. to all he had to do was go just a little, you know, a little farther away, and they would not have discovered that. Well, by now, police are piecing together all of this information, and there are some suspicious circumstances pointing to the bar owner Bob Anderson as perhaps a suspect. He had spent time with Tom Penny in prison, and now the name Tom Penny has been brought up by this guy Lunsford. Oh my God. He also owned a Buick, which had been stolen after the crime had taken place. And it was the same uh, car that had been spotted at the country club, the two-toned Buick. So police began to put pressure on Tom Penny, on Bob Anderson, and Skeeter Baxter. But so far, only one would admit their involvement. It was Tom Penny who cracked. He admitted the three had been involved and that Bob Anderson had gone into the apartment with him. Both men had shot the Miley women. He had met Skeeter Baxter months before in a bar. Knowing Skeeter had been employed at the country club, Tom Penny inquired about whether or not Skeeter could get him a job there. And that's when Skeeter proposed the plan to rob the club. Skeeter informed him, quote, there's just one old woman who sleeps there with three or four thousand dollars under her pillow. And there's nothing to do but go in there and pick up the, the money. No gun would be needed because, again, there's only one old lady. Yeah. Damn it, Skeeter. See, with a name like Skeeter, you, you think it would be uh, fairly sensible and trustworthy. But it's not to be, you know? Yeah. Why would you think that a Skeeter would be trustworthy? I feel like a Skeeter, he gets that nickname because he's probably irritating and always buzzing in your ear with some bullshit. He wouldn't be trustworthy. That's the joke, man. It's buzzing in your ear with some bullshit. If I have to explain it you to gotta, you. you got to swat that Skeeter. It's not funny If anymore. you know a Skeeter, you swat him right now. <laughs> Damn, there's like Skeeters all across the world. Maybe yeah. just this country. Someone's <laughs> listening right now and they reach over and like punch their brother who's yeah. named Skeeter. I damn it, Skeeter. I knew you was going to be a dumbass. Tom Penny told that he and Anderson left Louisville on the 27th around 8.30 p.m., each driving a portion of the way. Reaching Lexington around 11 p.m., they went out to where Baxter worked at the club. They, um, they didn't find him there, but they did find him at a roadhouse owned by a woman named Ma Gabbard. The three got into the car and talked about the robbery. Skeeter Baxter told them it was a good night at the club. They had a decent crowd and would be a great night to rob the place. They were having a dance, had a lot of people there. Surely there would be a lot of cash on hand. So uh, since she was run, um, Marion's mother was running the country club, the whole idea is she would have the receipts for the day to be deposited later kind of thing in her yes. room. They drove around, hit up another roadhouse, then purchased a flashlight around 1.30 a.m. from a drugstore. Anderson would later be identified by the clerk at this drugstore. Damn, what drugstore is open? Flashlight. I was thinking that myself. 24-7. Later, Skeeter agreed they could meet at the club grounds around 2 a.m. So when Penny and Anderson arrive, they ended up having to wait about 20 minutes for Skeeter Baxter to show up. Skeeter was supposed to cut the phone lines, but claimed he had a lack of opportunity to carry through with it. Skeeter had people with him. Um, so he has this teenage boy. He's got, you know, Ma Gabbard, the bar owner. He's got her daughter in the car with him. Well, Skeeter's up to no good. So he's got, like, some people with him. So he tells his, his friends, these, these robber friends, uh, I got to go drop them off at the pump house and then I'll come back. So you've got all these witnesses, like the teenage boy, seeing these men in a car. Oh, my God. It's just stupid. You should have you realized that a man named Skeeter planning this out or even uh, starting this conversation was going to um, end up badly. Now, when Skeeter returns, he walks them around the clubhouse, shows them the apartment. He points to the room where Mrs. Miley sleeps. And... He tells one of the men to remove the window screen because remember the kitchen window was like open. He's like, well, you can remove that window screen and go through. So that's when Tom Penny climbs through and unlocks the rear door to the club. Bob Anderson enters into the clubhouse 
But Skeeter Baxter didn't join them inside, and that's when he left and leaves the two men there. On October 12th in Fort Worth, 32-year-old Tom Penny signs a confession detailing his involvement in the Miley murders. Hearing the news and just feeling overcome, Fred Miley, who's, you know, still back in Kentucky, he collapses and he's taken to a hospital and diagnosed with mental and physical exhaustion. Wow. Overhearing this news about um, these, this plan and these murders have been, murderers have been caught. Well, yeah. I mean, as somebody they know, they, I'm sure they all know, the groundskeeper basically sounds like what the Skeeter is. Um, and... Uh, yeah, he set all this up. He put it all into motion. It was on October 17th that Skeeter Baxter was brought to the police station for a third round of questioning. Tom Penny led investigators to the location of the two guns, explaining how they had been buried. And by the end of the day, Skeeter Baxter was arrested and charged as the third suspect in the robbery slash murder. It was on October 27th of 1941 that a grand jury returned a true bill charging the three with the murder of Marion Miley. The indictment covered seven counts, which covered every phase of the crime of homicide and conspiracy. On Monday, December the 8th, the men went before a judge. Bob Anderson thought the bombing of Pearl Harbor would save their necks. He kept telling the guys, oh, it's fine, relax. P- P- Pearl Harbor's just happened, so... This small crime at this little country club isn't going to make, a, you know, it's not going to mean a hill of beans to people because we've been attacked. Yeah. We're going to war. We're going to get off. Don't yeah, worry Yeah, they're it. probably going to let us go join the army, guys. Yeah. What a I mean, dumb. he's what just like, this is not a big deal. It's no problem. Yeah, it's no big deal. I mean, you've heard what the Japanese have done in Pearl Harbor, right? I mean, they're probably, look, you hear that? That's probably them coming to let us out right now. Jesus. However, separate trials would be held. Anderson went to trial on December 12th, Skeeter Baxter on the 15th, and Tom Penny on the 18th of December. A witness named Jack Reeves testified that Skeeter Baxter had approached him months before the murders with a proposition to rob the clubhouse. Skeeter had said there was only one old woman at the club, and it was easy money. So much the same story that Tom Penny had and that... Um, the Lunsford gentleman had come forward with. Yeah, she has trash bags of money, and, and she she often leaves them outside the unlocked door. So it only took 51 minutes for a verdict to be reached um, in the death penalty for Tom Penny. Skeeter and Bob Anderson would also be sentenced to die in the electric chair. Then in December of 1942, a stay was issued for Bob Anderson. So Tom Penny had made up a story about a dead man named Buford Stewart having been involved in the crime so that Bob Anderson might walk. However, when they went before a judge with the story, uh, Penny clammed up and wouldn't answer any questions regarding Anderson's innocence. Okay. So he had like told the story, but then when he went before a judge... He clammed up. Yeah. So on February 26th, the three men were executed at Eddyville for the Miley murders. No relatives of the trio were present for the electrocutions. That sounds about right. I feel like they didn't come from a strong uh, family. (laughs) You don't? No. So for my resources today, I finally read Beverly Bell's book, The Murder of Mary and Miley, which I've had on Kindle for about two years was planning to cover this case for two years, but we finally getting to it. And then I used a lot of old newspaper articles um, as well for a resource. Well, that, you were right. I had not heard this story. I'm sure it's uh, basically part of the lore of Lexington, I would think. But that was interesting, um, tragic. I mean, just these bumbling idiots, man. If only they'd all three been in a car and like drove off a cliff before they were able to do any of this. Exactly. It's really sad to think this promising young woman, this golfer, was snuffed out kind of at the peak of her golfing career. Yeah. You know, she could today be a household name. Yeah. Well, I mean, she, yeah, she really could have been a legend in the sport and, uh, you know, a a legend for um, women's rights and, you know, women progressing in different things. Well, honey, I know you think I'm ignoring you, but I was looking through images of Molly. You're very irritating. He does this. He gets on the computer, and he's, like, staring at the computer and not 
focusing on the podcast. No, I was looking at your mouth. And it's interesting because she is uh she's pretty, but she's not like this, this ultimate beauty that kinda um you you know when you Well one, beauty is subjective, Dylan. Well, it's and true. two, um the nineteen forties, what was considered beautiful by forty standards, not the same as today. Okay. Which is probably better because today it's been bastardized and this is so. back when women were natural looking, Dylan. It's true. Right? It's true. She doesn't have a bunch of fat um, implanted in her ass. <laughs> no, she's natural. Right? She's natural. She has a, a glowing smile. She's. I think she's a very naturally pretty woman. It's true. Why are you talking about her looks anyway? Oh, no, maybe, don't... maybe by golf standards, she's very beautiful, okay? I don't know what female golfer, golfers look like. Don't make it out like I'm being some kind of tool. You are. I'm not. Always. Well, thank you for that story, Heather. I'll thank you anyway. And um, so this has been on your radar that long? Yeah. Wow. Interesting. I know. I'm finally, yeah. finally telling the tale. Yes. Of Mary and Miley. Well, I appreciate that. Um, it is a beautiful day here in Western North Carolina. Oh, God. Now he's going to start talking about the weather. <laughs> We're drying out, um, warming <laughs> up. And no. uh, we hope everyone out there is having a, a, a great day. Right, Dylan, yeah. we have reopened our Mountain Murders merch store. If you go to mountainmurderspodcast.com, you can find mugs, t-shirts, hats. We know you've been dying for some Mountain Murders merch. And now you can get some. Noise. Now, Dylan. Y'all should I get all that stuff. Don't have your naked calendar up yet. Okay. But when we get your... Your bro boudoir shots. Okay. We're going to make a calendar and we will sell it on Mount Murders. Okay. Yeah. It's still working through the legal team. They're making sure that uh, true. Um, we're not really, because a lot of some of those shots are a lot of recreations of iconic scenes in Amer- American yeah, history. Exactly. Like, you know, Washington crossing the Delaware, uh, me up there on the rowboat with a lantern, and that's all I have in my hand. I know. It's all and, you're wearing uh, is the lantern. Yeah. But uh, so we're making sure on things like that. You know, we don't want to get messy because we, we honestly, when this calendar drops, we think it's going to be huge. We think it's going to be huge. It's going to be international, obviously. And uh, yeah, so we got to, you know, cross all the T's, dot all the I's. But uh, that will be forthcoming soon. It, it is. Yeah, yeah totally. In, a, in, in the meantime, fortnight. you can check out the podcastcalendars.com website for your true crime podcast calendar. And if you use Mountain Murders promo, code mountain murders you get five dollars off the true crime podcast calendar and soon we'll be bringing you the naked dylan calendar but first you should probably get the true crime one because it's a real tangible (laughs) item that you can have in your possession of course heather is talking about the real (laughs) calendar the indie podcast calendar if you will and uh very excited can't wait to get our copy of that and uh listen and check out all these new shows Check it out, or check out all these in, independent podcasts. They're not, they're not, they might not be new. See how good I am at this. You're awesome. I don't need ad copy. You know what I, I mean? See that? Yeah. All right. Well, again, thank you for being loyal listeners to Mountain Murders as we have celebrated our four year anniversary. We are heading into 2023. Can you believe, Dylan? We will have five years of podcasting at the end of this year. Whoa. You single-handedly, we Mount Murders, I should say, it is a team, uh, single-handedly brought Appalachian true crime to the forefront of the true crime genre. Oh, did we? Yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking credit. Happy New Year. <laughs> Bye.